The first time I was ever really aware of a recording and mixing engineer was when I was listening to the Michael Jackson album Thriller. I loved the music, but I was also really into how it sounded. It sounded way better than anything else around at that time, at least to me. So I was really intrigued to find out who the genius behind this was. After looking at the credits, I saw the producer was Quincy Jones, although I had no idea what a producer was at that time. But also, just below it, it read, Recorded and mixed by Bruce Widdeen. There was no further information, pictures or anything like that. It wasn't until many years later with the dawn of the internet that I was able to find out a lot more about his techniques and the famous Acusonic recording process. So here is an overview of Bruce's methods and how that genius peaked with his collaboration with Michael Jackson and how we can implement that in our own productions. After dropping out of the University of Minneapolis in 1954, where he was studying electrical engineering and music, he set up his own recording studio, recording artists such as Art Blakey and Herbie Mann. By 1957, he'd sold this and moved to Chicago, where he began working for RCA Victor, and shortly after, Universal Recording Corporation, where he worked under chief engineer Bill Putnam. It was in Chicago that he first met Quincy Jones, and the pair worked on albums for artists like Dina Washington and Sarah Vaughan. Throughout this time, Bruce was experimenting with stereo sound by using ambient mics to enhance the recordings he made with Duke Ellington and Count Basie. He had to wait a few years though before he could really explore these techniques fully. Increasing multi-track technologies allowed more space for recording individual instruments in stereo. In fact, when Bruce got hold of his first 16-track recorder, he said, Great, finally an 8-track stereo recorder. It was on the 1978 Quincy Jones album, Sounds, that featured Luther Vandross, Shaka Khan and Herbie Hancock, that Swedeen developed a system of multi-track multiplexing that utilised stereo microphonic recordings, designed exclusively for his work with Jones. This method would later be known as the Acusonic recording process, a combination of accurate and sonic. The accurate part of it referred to the accuracy of the stereophonic sound imagery. The sonic part referred to the fact that it was sound that they are trying to characterise. Here was a short clip of a recording of acoustic guitar, one in mono and one in stereo to give you an idea of the space this creates. Using two or more multi-track tape machines, Bruce could have nearly an unlimited number of tracks. This allowed him to get a more genuine stereophonic image, instead of a stereo sound simulated by monophonic manipulation. In the end, the song's sound was not only crystal clear, but exuded a sphere of sound rather than a wall of sound, giving the listener a virtual live experience. Many in the industry thought the Acusonic recording process was a physical device. In fact, on several occasions, Bruce was offered impressive sums of money by recording studios and companies that wanted to purchase the Acusonic recording process, thinking it was a black box that recorded sound could be processed through. Bruce recollects one awkward circumstance when he got a phone call in the studio saying that a photographer team from a very respected, very important foreign trade journal was in an airplane on the way from somewhere overseas to shoot a cover photo over the Acusonic recording process machine. I don't remember exactly what I did, but I do recall mumbling something to the highly confused photographer about the machine being away for repairs, and we'd have to reschedule the photo shoot. I had no idea when Quincy, Michael and I came up with the name, there would be so much interest in it. Bruce was strong in the belief that the early reflections of recording affected the listener's emotional response to the music, even to the extent of recording synthesizers and drum machines to be played back through monitor speakers in the room, and then blended back in with a direct sound. The first time Michael and Bruce worked together was on the movie soundtrack for The Wiz. The 18-year-old Michael was of course already an established star for some years with his brothers, but yet to properly break out on his own. It was during the making of this album that he and Quincy had plotted his emergence as a star in his own right. With the addition of the ace songwriter Rod Temperton, the team came up with a Grammy award winning Off The Wall album. 
Although a big success, nothing could compare to what they achieved with their next album, Thriller. To this day, it's still the best-selling album of all time, and a good part of its success can be attributed to Swedeen's meticulous attention to detail. The multi-track multiplexing technique he'd developed just a few years earlier really helped the sonic qualities of Thriller, where he was able to record not only in stereo, but more parts for greater control at the mixing stage. An example of this would be recording of vocal harmonies. Normally an ensemble would be recorded simultaneously to save track space, but he was able to record each harmony in turn, giving him the ability to balance and pan each part separately. Another benefit of this method was to maximise the rhythm track recordings by using a 16-track machine. With fewer tracks for the same 2-inch tape than the 24-track machine, there was a greater track width for each part recorded. This meant less noise but also better transient response for a punchier rhythm track. Bruce would then bounce this down to the master session tape as a stereo mix, but keep the initial 16-track tape so he was able to go back and make changes later if he wished. A huge benefit of this method was that every time the master tape was being used, there would be increasing wear and tear on the tape itself that diminished the sound quality. By preserving submixes, he was able to massively cut down on this degradation and preserve the sound throughout the recording process. Swedeen was a big fan of preserving transients and was quite lenient with his use of compression, saying famously and perhaps controversially that compression was for kids. He did, however, use the 1176 on Michael's vocals, but only a smidge, apparently. He believed that compression was a crutch, and the right choice of microphone had a bigger part to play in the control of transients. For example, his use of ribbon mics for percussion instruments is evident on the track Don't Stop Till You Get Enough, and the use of the short SM7 microphone for the majority of the vocals on Thriller. The SM7 is a dynamic mic popular for broadcasters and not a fancy condenser that he had plenty of in his locker. Michael's vocals sound incredible on this album, so the decision alone is testament to an engineer who was always thinking about the right tool for the job, regardless of reputation or intended application. Michael was to continue working with Bruce until the end, and to this day the sonic qualities of these albums are remarkable. From the analogue days of Off the Wall and Thriller, then the early digital years of Bad, right through to his final studio album Invincible. The legacy of Bruce Fiddin's work with Michael Jackson will live on for some time in the music and the lessons we've learned from him.